I'm Blake Newsom, the Dean of the Chapel at New Orleans Baptist Seminary. We're here today with Dr. David Platt, the uh, senior pastor at the Church of Brook Hills in Birmingham. Glad to have you, David. Man, it's always great to be back here. It's uh, good to have you, and just want to talk a little bit about preaching and uh, some different aspects about preaching. would like to begin uh, bringing up Ian Bounds' statement that the real sermon is made in the prayer closet. Prayer makes the man, prayer makes the pre preacher, and prayer makes the pastor. And just to get your feedback on that, and also sort of uh, the role of the personal devotional life of the preacher, and maybe even some practical things uh, that you have uh, engaged in in your life. Yeah, there's so much there, and Ian Bounds has had a formative impact. I recommend anybody uh, who's pastoring, preaching, to read Power Through Prayer or any number of other things he wrote, but uh, um, there's no question, and he said it, I think, best, what you said, and as preachers, we preach as, as, a, you're, as a preacher, you're a dying man preaching a dying man. Like we, we need the life of Christ to infuse us in our ministry and our preaching and in the preaching event in particular, as well as the preparation event leading up to that. And so there's no question that there must be a, a primary focus on prayer in, in my own life and my sermon preparation process, sermon delivery process, everything. And so when I think about personal devotional life, I want my preaching to be the overflow of communion with God. Um, and so in, in my personal devotional life, just what I, what I do is I spend time each morning uh, reading through the Bible in a devotional way through Robert Murray McShane's Bible reading plan. And so uh, that's, for those who might not be familiar with that, it's just four chapters a day, two in the Old Testament, usually two in the New Testament, and, uh, and just getting different pictures in Scripture. And so to spend time reading, meditating on different portions of Scripture, just hearing from God. So I may be preaching on some passage in 1 Corinthians. We're about to start a book series in 1 Corinthians um, at Brook Hills. But, but in the morning, I'm spending time in Psalms and Exodus and John and uh, Galatians. And so in the process, just being filled with the Word and that time in prayer, intentionally praying through different things that I'm praying for my life, my family, the church, the city where I live, the nations, all of that is going to come to bear on that study when I get into the First Corinthians text. And the intimacy with God, the sensitivity to His voice, all of that is going to have an effect on my heart when I come to this text to study it, to prepare a sermon, and then to preach it. And so what I don't want to do is preach lifeless sermons that are disconnected from intimate communion with God. And so even in the, even in the, I don't know if this is really, I keep going on here, but the prayerful meditation on the text that I'm preaching is probably, I'd, I'd say maybe the most important part of the, of the sermon preparation process. Um, so on the truth of the text, so obviously you got to do the study to get to the truth of the text, but then along the way and, and as you're seeing it, to really spend time in intentional, prayerful meditation on the truth of that text. Without that, then we're just, we're just given information as opposed to preaching out of the overflow of transformation for the sake of transformation in other people's lives. I think there's a reason why, last thing I'll say there, is the reason why Acts chapter 6 talks about devoting ourselves to the ministry of the Word and to prayer. And I know in my own life, if I'm not careful, I can spend tons of time in the Word and devote myself to the Word and the text and uh, in a way that is not commensurate with the time I'm devoting to prayer. And so I've got I've to keep that tension there and give myself to both. That's good. Uh, take us now from that sort of starting point that you were just talking about with prayer, the personal devotional life, prayerful meditation on the passage that you will be preaching. Uh, what is, uh, just give us sort of a sketch of your preparation process. I know whole classes uh, for a semester are taught on that, but maybe yeah. just a, a brief overview of sort of how you walk through the uh, preparation process. So my preparation, the way it looks on a normal basis is Monday I get started. Uh, I'll relax a little bit in the morning with my family, but then I'll dive into, um, so I've got it, I've, I'm usually preaching, like I mentioned, I'm going to be preaching through First Corinthians, so I know what text I'm going to be in. And so I'll read the text and start this process of prayerful meditation. Okay, God, I, I want to, a week from now, I'm going to stand before a group of people 
and I'm going to say, this is what you said. I want to make sure I know what you said. So help me to understand this. Help me to internalize this in my heart from the very beginning. Then I'm going to spend a lot of Monday doing exegetical work. And so I'd say most of my Monday is actually doing exegetical work where I'm walking through the text, just studying, using other resources, doing different things to, to, walk, to do the exegesis. Uh, Tuesday, I've got a, a kind of a meeting day. Um, so I do a variety of things in the office at, at Brook Hills where I pastor on Tuesday. And, uh, and then Wednesday morning, I'm going to spend, I'm going to pick up that exegetical work and come back there. By Thursday, I'm spending some intentional time during the day. Um, and this is an ideal week, which is not always the case. But on Thursday now, taking the exegetical work that I've done and beginning to consider how does this all come together and in a way. And so I begin to form sermon outline. Um, truth of the text that I think is, is primary here. How do I communicate that? Dividing that into, into I, do, I do an outline that I give to our folks. And so by Friday morning, I've got to turn that outline in that our folks will have that is kind of a listening guide as we walk through the text. And so I'll have that done by Thursday. And then if not on Thursday, then sometimes Friday or Saturday night or even into Sunday morning sometimes, I'm writing a manuscript. So I write a full manuscript that I take with me. Every sermon. Uh, yeah, everyone. So I write out every single word, and I, and I pretty much follow it to a T. So, really? Yeah. I didn't always do that. I didn't do that until... I, I definitely didn't do that before I started pastoring. And even when I first started pastoring, it was kind of a morphing from an abbreviated outline to a really specific outline to now Why every the change? word. I think a number of reasons. One, I think what was driving me most is I just want to make my words count. I'm not... I'm not saying that I always do, but I really want to do my best to make my every word count. And so I want to think through every word I'm going to say, how I'm going to say this, nuance this, personally, pastorally, how, how am I going to address this? And then, uh, and then it also is really helpful when going back to, to be able to have, I mean, the whole sermon written out that I've preached. I mean, that's just a, a good resource for next time I come around to that text or anything like that. So it's helpful for a story. But I, I really... I really want to make every word count in the preaching event. So that's what's driving me there. Yeah. Now you've done a good bit of preaching and still do on a regular basis uh, in many different countries. So how does your preaching on a weekly basis at the Church of Brook Hills, how is that different in some ways than your preaching in other countries? And what have you learned about preaching uh, mm -hmm. through your preaching in other countries? Wow. Well, differences are, are many when I think about differences in other countries. And usually anything, whether it's another country or in this country, most of what I'm doing outside of Brook Hills is based on things we're doing at Brook Hills. And so most of my focus for new prep and that kind of stuff is on Brook Hills. And then I want overflow outside of Brook Hills to be, yeah, the overflow of what I'm preaching through at Brook Hills. So um, when I'm in another context, particularly overseas preaching, a lot of challenges. One, I've got to, I've got to be shorter uh, because I've got usually translation issues that you're dealing with, and so your sermon's cut in half, and that's if you had the same amount of time, and so it's definitely shorter. Um, but this is where, you know, if nothing, I, I'm driven toward expository preaching for many, many different reasons, uh, theologically, but even practically. I want to, expository preaching, if I'm preaching the text here, it's going to preach the exact same. Now, it's going to be applied differently. I'm going to have to contextualize application, but I don't have to contextualize meaning. Like the meaning is the same. The meaning is the same here as it is there. And so when I'm in another context, I'm not saying, all right, what, do I, what does this text mean for this? I'm thinking, no, what does this text mean? Now, how can I wisely apply it here? And so that's the real challenge for me in another context is an application. And so that's where the more I know that context, the more I, I've served alongside partners or people in that context, the more I know the church, what they're walking through, the culture, what it's like, then I'm able to wisely apply the text. That's much more natural in Birmingham, Alabama than it is for me in a village in rural India. And so I've got to think through intentionally how to make that application. Trusting the interpretation is going to be the same, but being more intentional about application. Uh, you've had a, a good bit of experience and uh, just different opportunities for such a young guy. What is the most valuable lesson you've learned or lessons you've learned so far in your ministry? Oh, wow. That's a huge question, yes, Blake. Um, <laughs> all right, so the, the two words that come to mind, 
are uh, surrender and abide. Uh, so here's, here's where my mind's going with that. Um, when I think about where I am right now, by God's grace, as a pastor of this church, or uh, I, I, this was not in the plan. Nothing. I can, since my first day on this campus, for example, at New Orleans Seminary, I couldn't have planned out one of those years that's happened in the last 13 years and what the, the twists and turns that have come about, I mean, in so many different ways, family-wise, life-wise, ministry-wise, I couldn't have planned any of that. And, uh, and so I look back and I think, all right, and this is what I encourage our folks to do uh, in, in the church that I pastor, is one, surrender. Like, I want my life to be a blank check on the table before the Lord with no strings attached, saying wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, uh, whether that's, yeah, whether that's live in New Orleans, whether that's live in Birmingham. And, and that was a really challenging process, praying through that, because this was not our desire when Heather and I first started thinking about this. Like, no, it was the last thing we want to do. And, but, but we put the blank check on the table, Lord, what do you want us to do? And, just, and surrendering to Him and, and, and with no strings attached, and then abiding in Him, uh, walking with Him in prayer, in the Word, in obedience to His command, making disciples right where wherever God has placed me, wherever God's placed anybody. I, and I'm just convinced, and there's a lot of confidence that I have in, not in myself, but in the grace of God here, that if I'm surrendered to Him and I'm abiding in Him, He's not going to let me go the wrong way. Like, He's going to lead me. He's going to guide me. He's going to direct me. He's going to protect me. Uh, and I'm, what I mean by protection is not even physical protection. I mean spiritual protection. Um, but he's, he, he wants to be glorified in my life more than I want Him to be glorified in my life. And so if I'm surrendered to Him and abiding in Him, then He's going to... He's going to lead and guide me. And so that's where I try to continually focus my life, focus our family, uh, call our kids to right, trust God and walk with God. And when those two realities are happening in our lives, I think we have a lot of confidence that by God's grace and His sovereign mercy, He will lead, guide us to the people, places, positions where we can most effectively make disciples of all nations and do it all in a way that's for our good and ultimately for His glory. I think that's a good statement to end on. So thank you for your time, David. Yeah. I appreciate your ministry. Appreciate uh, just everything you're doing for, your, for the Lord and uh, definitely for your surrendered heart. Mm. So thank you. Nice, Mike.